Wormwood! I was delighted to hear from Triptoes that your patient has made some very desirable new acquaintances, and that you seem to be using this event in a very promising manner. I gather that the middle-aged married couple who came to his office the other day are just the sort of people we want him to know. Rich, smart, superficially intelligent, and brightly skeptical about everything in the world. I gather they are even vaguely activist, though not on moral grounds, but from an ingrained habit of belittling anything that concerns the great mass of their fellow humanity, and also from a bit of uh, literary and fashionable communism. This is excellent, and you seem to have made good use of all his social, sexual, and intellectual vanity. Tell me more. Has he committed himself deeply? I don't mean in words. Uh, there's a subtle play of looks and tones and laughs by which a mortal can convey that he is of the same party as those to whom he is speaking. This is the sort of betrayal you should especially encourage, because the man does not quite realize it himself until you have made withdrawal quite difficult. No doubt he must soon realize that his own faith is in direct opposition to the assumptions on which all conversation with his new friends is based. I don't think this matters very much, so long as you can persuade him to postpone any open acknowledgement of that fact. And, with the help of shame, pride, modesty, and vanity, this should be easy to do. So long as the postponement lasts, he will be in a false position. He will be silent when he should speak, and laugh when he should be silent. He will assume, at first only in his manner, but then in his words, all sorts of cynical and skeptical attitudes which are not really his. But if you play him well enough, they may well become his. For every mortal eventually becomes whatever it is that he is pretending to be. This is elementary. The real question is how to prepare for the enemy's counterattack. The first thing is to delay for as long as possible the moment at which he realizes this new pleasure is a temptation. Now, since the enemy's servants have been preaching the world as one of the great standard temptations for over 2,000 years, this might seem difficult to do. But fortunately, they've said precious little about it for the last few decades. In modern Christian writings, though I see much, much more than I would like about mammon, I see very few of the old warnings about worldly vanities, the choice of friends, and the value of time. All that kind of thing your patient would probably classify as Puritanism. And may I remark in passing that the value we have given to that word is one of the great triumphs of the last hundred years. By it we save annually thousands of humans from temperance, chastity, and sobriety of life. Sooner or later, however, the real nature of his new friends will become apparent to him, and then your tactic will have to depend upon the intelligence of the patient. If he is a big enough fool, you can get him to realize their character only when they are absent, and their presence can be made to sweep away all criticism. If this succeeds, then he may be induced to live, and I have known many humans to live, two parallel lives. He will not only appear to be, but will actually be a different man in each of the circles he frequents. Failing this, there is a subtler and more entertaining method. He can be made to take positive pleasure in the perception that the two sides of his life are inconsistent. This is done by exploiting his vanity. He can be taught to enjoy kneeling beside the grocer on Sunday just because he remembers that the grocer could not possibly understand the urbane and mocking world which he inhabited on Saturday evening, and, contrawise, to enjoy the crude humor and blasphemy over coffee with these admirable friends all the more because they could not possibly understand the deep and spiritual world inside himself. You see the idea. The worldly friends touch him on one side and the grocer on the other, and he is the complete, balanced, complex man who sees round them all. Thus, while being simultaneously treacherous to at least two sets of people, he will feel, instead of shame, an undercurrent of self-satisfaction. Finally, if all else fails, you can persuade him, in defiance of conscience, to continue the new acquaintance on the grounds that he is in some unspecified way doing these people good by drinking their cocktails and laughing at their jokes and that to cease to do so would be in some way intolerant or, of course, puritanical. Meanwhile, you will of course take the obvious precaution of seeing that this new development causes him to spend more than he can afford and neglect his work and his mother. Her jealousy and alarm at his evasiveness or rudeness will be invaluable in aggravating domestic tensions. 